Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the NPT Explained. My name is Lily. I'm a neurologic physical therapist, and I'm also a professor at the University of Texas at El Paso. And if you know me, if you've seen me before, I am the Brain PT. So the Brain PT, if you don't know, it's a social media uh, resource that uh, contains a bunch of videos in topics of neurologic physical therapy. So today we're going to be reviewing questions of the typical PT platform. Um, and if you're preparing for the NPTE exam or just curious about what, um, what makes these questions up, um, you're in the right place. So today we're diving deep into the questions, breaking them down, analyzing them, and just giving you tips on how to tackle them like a pro. So grab your notes, get comfy, and let's get started. So question number one. So this is all about um, examination. So we're going to talk about neuro exam, okay? So a 35 year old male patient is brought to the neuro clinic by his family for a physical therapy eval. The patient has suffered a traumatic brain injury six months ago after falling from a ladder and hitting his head on the concrete. Since the injury, the family reports that the patient has been experiencing personality changes, including increased impulsivity and irritability. During the PT exam, you find that all MMT and range of motion scores are within normal limits. Based on the scenario, what part of the brain do you believe was damaged? All right, so take a moment and think about what I just read. Now, if you are in front of a screen and you're able to see my screen, you'll, you'll be able to read or reread and you're already looking at the answer choices. But if not, let me read them for you. So answer A, frontal lobe. Answer B, parietal lobe. C, brainstem. And D, basal ganglia. Okay, so this for you, the how do you answer this question? So you need to know a little bit of what's in the answer choices, and that means neuroanatomy, okay? My favorite topic. Uh, you need to know the functions of the frontal lobe. You need to know the, func the functions of the parietal lobe, brainstem, and basal, basal ganglia. So frontal lobe, we see everything that has to do with executive function, personality. We see, um, you know, that the motor areas are part in the frontal lobe so here we deal with that and we see a lot of um like impulsivity or like um a lack of uh, awareness of what you're saying of like lack of filter things like that when you have someone with a traumatic brain injury so a lot of that cognitive um functions are found in the frontal lobe now, parietal lobe here, we deal more with somatosensory, we deal with um, like visual spatial orientation, we deal with when someone may, may have some um, neglect, here we might be thinking parietal lobe sometimes, so we think of sensory stuff, parietal lobe. Brainstem, we think about vital functions, respiratory, cardiac, we see all the cranial nerves. So here, I'm not too convinced this question really tells us a lot about cranial nerves. And the last one is basal ganglia. When you see basal ganglia, you should be thinking motor, so movement. That's why people with Parkinson's have trouble with movement. People with um, Huntington disease have trouble with movement because it's either too much movement or too little movement. So let's go back to the question so this question is telling us that this patient is dealing with personality changes increased impulsivity and very irritable so all goes back to cognition now can you now know which is the answer and i think you're thinking the same thing as me and i believe the answer is frontal lobe so let's take a look Again, full disclosure, if I get a question wrong, it's going to be a learning experience for both of us, but let's see. Okay, so frontal lobe, it's the answer. You were correct. So again, frontal lobe helps govern personality, impulsivity. If damaged, there might be no breaking mechanism for self-control. Like I told you, like no filter and like impulsivity, there's no breaks there. Um, a person might find it's difficult to control their anger or their words or their just like 
you know, emotions, things like that. Although emotions, we dig, dig it into other parts of the brain, but you know, you, you get me. So now again, I told you why B is not because B is more of sensory C brainstem. It's more like vital functions and D it's basal ganglia. So here you can see um, how to approach a question like this. So next one. All right, so we have a little bit again, uh, and I say again, because if you listen to previous or you know other episodes where I've talked about these questions, the combination of, of a little bit of neuro ortho, not too strong, but let's see. Okay, 35 year old visits your PT clinic after or following a recent injury. The patient reports a fracture of the calcaneus due to a fall. Oh, okay, this is gonna be a hard one for me. Okay, we're dealing with bones. <laughs> So during your evaluation, you observe sensory deficits. Okay, so sensory deficits, let me go back to the dermatomes um, on the lateral aspect of the foot and the calf. Okay, so now, now it's getting easier and easier. Which nerve is mostly most likely affected by the fracture resulting in these sensory deficits? Okay. <laughs> So let's take a look at the answer choices. So we have tibial nerve, we have common peroneal nerve, we have sural nerve, and we have femoral nerve. Okay, so if you take a look at these answer choices, can you start um, crossing out the ones that you're not too sure? Because I think I can. So femoral nerve, I don't know if I would be too um, sure about the femoral nerve as the answer. I don't know if you agree with me, but let's see. Okay, so let's go back to the question. This person complains of sensory deficits on the lateral aspect of the foot. So pretty low. Okay. And the calf. So peroneal nerve, it's, it's up, right? So lateral aspect of the foot. I think common peroneal is not the answer because common peroneal, it's, it's a little bit higher, like close to the knee and the lateral aspect. And then the sural nerve, I believe this one is kind of lower, right? It's, if I remember correctly, the sural nerve, it's kind of close to the foot. <laughs> so we're getting close. And then the tibial nerve, I think those tibial and peroneal are just big ones. So I'm not too sure if the tibial nerve, the tibial nerve, I believe this, this um, it's more like, like in the back. Um, so what do you, what do we think guys? What do we think? Do we think is strong? Do we think is, Common peroneal for sure, I can say no. Uh, let's go with sural again. Ugh, the, this is a little bit more complex and, and challenging, but let's go with sural. I don't know what you think. I might be wrong and you might be right. Okay, we did it. Yes, it's sural nerve. Okay. <laughs> I need to brush up on these um, like nerve distribution uh, reviews because I feel like I'm not too strong in this. Jeez. Okay, so answer choice C, sural nerve is correct because in the context of a calcaneus fracture, the sural nerve, a sensory nerve on the lateral aspect of the leg and foot is often at risk. Damage to the sural nerve can lead to sensory deficits in the lateral foot and calf. Okay, so a tibial nerve is not the right answer because tibial nerve supplies a posterior like i said compartment of the leg of the lower leg and the sole of the foot it's not affected in calcaneus fracture so if you have someone with a calcaneus fracture and they complain with sensory deficits of the lateral part of their foot and the calf then sural nerve okay and then common peroneal again is just uh pretty high and it's the anterior and lateral okay 
of the leg and it's not typically associated with the foot like we said it's pretty high and then the femoral nerve it's just too high it's on the thigh so that is your uh, question number two next question okay back to the brain <laughs> a pt is working with a 45 year old patient recovering from a severe stroke and a cabbage so coronary artery bypass graft times two during the session the therapist evaluates the patient's ability to discriminate between variations in weight by having him grasp blocks of different weights in each hand all right which specific test is being undertaking as part of this assessment okay <laughs> so Let's take a look. Tactile localization, answer A. B, graphesthesia. C, stereognosis. And D, barognosis. Okay, so here this question require, requires us to be aware of each of these tests that are mostly of central um, sensations. So sensations that are processed up um, in the brain. Um, well, I mean, all, all sensations end up processed on the brain, but those sensations that are specific to um, be central functions, okay? So you know that there are sensations that are more down in the spinal cord that are afferent spinal cord, like pain, temperature, vibration, uh, proprioception and there are other type of sensations that are more specific and contained here in the brain if that's how i can mention that so things like again graphesthesia stereognosis barognosis and two-point discrimination or tactile localization okay so let's go down the list so tactile localization is a function of the brain where you distinguish two points or different points and being able to differentiate where are those points or where are you being touched, okay? Graphesthesia is the ability uh, to recognize writing, symbols, designs, or just numbers, letters, etc. okay? And, and this, when you do this, you need to actually trace it on the skin um, because you, you are able to recognize it by touch, okay? Stereognosis is the ability to, um, it's the mental perception of um, an object when you are kind of like touching it um, and not aware um, when you're not aware that you're actually like not looking at it. So for example, if you have someone um, like close your eyes and you put something on their hand and they're able to identify the object by touch. OK, so your patient is blindfolded or eyes closed and, and you tell, OK, can you tell me what object is this? OK, so that is stereognosis. Now, barognosis is the ability to perceive or estimate weight of an object by holding or lifting them. So back to the question, the therapist evaluates the patient's ability to discriminate between weights, different weights. So A, tactile localization, B, graphesthesia, C, stereognosis, or D, barognosis. What do you all think? I think you're thinking the same thing that I am, and that is D, barognosis. So let's take a look. All right, we got it right. So D, barognosis. This specific test that the, the PT is performing is the test for barognosis. So this is the, the assessing the ability to recognize various variations in weight or pressure applied to different areas of the body, okay? Now, A, tactile localization, it's not the one because this is identifying the location of a touch stimulus. B, graphesthesia, like I said, recognize numbers or letters drawn on the skin. And C, stereognosis involves recognition of objects placed in the hand and you manipulate it and recognize them. Okay, so 
if you wonder, this platform is typical PT. So this is a platform that they specialize in, in offering uh, programs where you can um, create your own exams. And as you can see, this platform is really great because it gives you the right answer, the wrong answer, the explanations. And I know they have a note um, um, section when you can start taking notes if you're actually going to take a actual test because you can customize if you want a quiz or that day you really want to take a full length test to see where you're at. So this is the this is uh, the part of neuro. And again, here I was able to customize it for me. And I picked um, neuro a specific examination. So all these questions are going to be uh, on neuro examination. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of the NPTE Explained and check out um, our so thank you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of NPTE Explained and check out um, the description for any additional resources. Bye for now.